Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Okay, so for our final uh, presentation in this uh, session, uh, we have uh, Simona uh, Samardiska. Um, Simona is an assistant professor in post-quantum cryptography at the Digital Security Group of Radboud University. Her expertise and research interests uh, are in the, uh, in the mathematics of post-quantum cryptography. Uh, she has been actively involved in the current NIST uh, post-quantum standardization uh, process as a principal submitter uh, of the second round candidate uh, MQDSS. Uh, and one of the submitters of uh, MEDS in the fourth round signature uh, um, uh, competition of NIST, or should I pronounce it MET? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering about that. Okay, so uh, uh, one of the submitters of MET. Um, and her lecture today will be about code sprays uh, cryptography. So please welcome my Simona. Thanks, Thomas, uh, for the intro. Um, okay, uh, so today I'll talk about code-based crypto. I know the slides look a bit different, but it's fine. Um, okay, so this uh, lecture is going to be on some basics of uh, code-based crypto, hopefully to give you a little bit of taste of uh, how these um, crypto systems work, uh, and I will not go uh, into details, and maybe somewhere uh, just to, to give you a little bit of uh, taste. So what is code-based crypto? So nowadays we know it's a uh, part of uh, post-quantum uh, crypto along with a bunch of other types of uh, crypto systems uh, which you are probably very well aware of. Uh, but actually, um, code-based cryptography is not new at all. Uh, if you would say that post-quantum cryptography is something very new that needs a lot of scrutiny to come, uh, code-based crypto is uh, not new. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, MacLeese uh, is as old as RSA. They were invented at the same year, 1978. And if you see this picture here, it contains a lot of post-quantum schemes that were uh, thought of a very, very long time ago. Uh, also, a code-based one is the Niederreiter encryption scheme in 86, also quite a long uh, time ago. So it's been a, a while, more than 40 years of uh, scrutiny, or maybe no, not a very big interest in these um, uh, schemes. So uh, you decide which one it might be. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you might ask why uh, we did not decide to use uh, MacLeese, uh, but uh, we went for RSA. Well, the thing is that um, the public keys are huge. Uh, even then, for the security uh, that was considered at, 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 at that time, uh, eight bits of uh, security, um, the public key is uh, huge. Uh, so, <clears throat> nowadays, in uh, the NIST competition, we have classic MacLeese, which is based on the Niederreiter uh, crypto systems, and for level one security, we need around uh, 260 kilobytes of uh, uh, so that's very conservative, but we do have some, yeah, some security in terms of well, it's been there forty-five years. It must be, uh, it must be good. Okay, so uh, how do these crypto systems work? So this is somewhat, somewhat similar to what uh, Leo said uh, previously, uh, but it uh, corresponds much, much better to uh, something that we've been using for a very, very long time in um, uh, communication. So. Uh, think of noisy channel communication. So we have our parties here that want to communicate through a noisy channel. Of course, during the noisy, during the transmission of the over the noisy channel, that, whether that be analog, uh, digital, or whatever, there will be some sort of noise, and the noise with inter it will interfere with your message. So if you just send uh, the message uh, once, you can expect that on the on the other side, like a lot of a lot of it will be wrong. So we don't want that. 
So we want some sort of a mechanism such that these messages will be encoded into something that on the other side with quite a uh, big certainty can be decoded to its original state. So there has to be some sort of redundancy added. Think of the simplest redundancy ever, the sim one of the simplest codes, but used quite a lot is the three repetition code. You just repeat your message three times. And yeah, you hope that you will not have um, uh, an error introduced at the sa exact same uh, place uh, the, the three times. Um, so um, this is our um, uh, coding, uh, coding uh, scenario. And uh, the, uh, the sender has some sort of an encoder and the receiver has some sort of a decoder. And what is important here is that the decoder should be efficient. So it's always important. So for example, with the, if we communicate with the, with, with the satellite, with some satellite or, or so, we really uh, want this to be efficient. Or think about your mobile phones. Well, you don't want to wait for the other side like half an hour uh, to be able to understand uh, what, the, uh, what is being said. So how is this used uh, in cryptography? Well, uh, the noise there was added by the noisy channel, right, because of the noisy channel. So in cryptography, what we can do is add intentional noise. And the intentional noise will be added by the uh, sender. So the sender will have the, uh, also uh, the, the task of the noisy channel to add uh, this, uh, this error. And on the other side, we have the, the same uh, thing. Uh, the receiver will, uh, will decode it. So there is, mm, uh, uh, th there is a one, one important question to ask uh, uh, here. So, okay, uh, the decoder will, uh, or the, the, the party that received the receiver will use the decoder and it will decode the message. But now you will say, okay, but everybody knows what the, which decoder is being used. So why doesn't the adversary, um, the adversary use this? Um, uh, well, um, we need to do some tricks here and actually for everyone else without a secret key, make this be a hard uh, problem. So it, it turns out that decoding uh, random code, just a randomly generated, let's say linear uh, code is a hard problem. So there are a very, very compared to the, the, the total number of codes of some uh, parameters, there are just very few that will be um, uh, efficient in the code. The rest is all inefficient. So the idea would be what if we uh, make somehow uh, uh, these codes to look uh, like random to the outside and to the uh, adversaries. Uh, okay, so some linear code basics. So a linear code is nothing but a, a vector subspace of some uh, given vector space. So it's linear so you can add uh, vectors uh, inside and it's uh, characterized by its uh, length and dimension. Okay, so my slides look very weird and they're not in the format that I sent and there's some very note here. Um, yeah, I, I think that in time this will get messier. <laughs> so, yeah, I can I can keep on uh, I can keep on talking about this. Uh, the yeah, it is PDF, but I don't know how it is. Yeah, it is happening. PDF. How it became PowerPoint and so on. Magic, ma ma magically. <laughs> yes, yeah, this this are. looks much yes, better. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, so, how do we define a code using um, <clears throat> using some a matrix that we call a generator uh, a matrix? And it's such that if you take whatever, uh, let's say, a message, let's say M, and you put it through this uh, matrix, or you multiply it by this uh, matrix, you obtain um, your code words. You could do this by something called parity check matrix. Uh, which uh, like to, to uh, give you a flavor of it. If you apply this matrix to a code word, you will get a zero. So it's a, uh, this is how you define it using, using parity check matrix. And these two multiplied uh, give a zero. 
An important thing is that you can put these in systematic form, and this is very uh, nicely uh, depicted by sending the message and the redundancy. Uh, so you don't need to uh, sort of like if, if this is not an, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say uh, we're not talking about uh, security now. So uh, if you just send the message, if you know the message, what what it is, and then you send it through this matrix. So if the first part is the, the message, and then the the second part is the redundancy, and you don't need to send or store the entire um, uh, uh, the entire matrix G or or H. So that's idea of this uh, thing here. And then we have code as well, I already introduced uh, this one. And then we have something called a humming weight, and this is what uh, what, uh, what we will uh, use to somehow quantify, um, uh, let's say, the errors that are being uh, introduced. Note that it, this doesn't have to be humming, I will mention this uh, later on. Okay, so I wanted to come to this part. So imagine you are, um, in a in a space, so you can you can think of um, I, let's say uh, a three three dimensional or here uh, two dimensional, and these are your uh, these are your code words, and <clears throat> we have something called a minimum uh, distance. So it's the smallest distance between uh, between two uh, code words. Why is this important? Because of this thing here. So this is somewhat similar to what Leo uh, mentioned, and that is uh, so uh, the minimum distance tells you. Uh, how far the apart or how far an error can be from a code word in order for it to be uniquely uh, uh, decoded. So, for example, uh, in this case, and the humming weight tells you how many uh, zeros and ones you have in a, um, uh, in, a uh, in a vector. Uh, so, if you have uh, more than in this picture here, more than t introduced errors during the transmission. Uh, then you cannot expect uh, the decoder to work properly, and it may decode to a different uh, code word. So you can um, reliably decode only up to some uh, some value, and this is half of the, the minimum uh, distance. This is also very relevant also for uh, communication, not, not, not only for cryptography. And so how do we encode the messages? Well, first from the message we obtain a code word. So this is multiplying by this matrix G, let's say. And then uh, through uh, transmission, you introduce some error, or this error can be um, uh, intentional, and then you obtain uh, Y, and then from Y, with the, this efficient decoder, you go back. Equivalently, you can look equivalently at this, and this is called syndrome uh, decoding, uh, given such, given some syndrome S, let's say. Your goal is to find an E, where E has small weight such that E times this H gives you this uh, syndrome. So if you take a look at this uh, equation here, so this is matrix multiplication. So you are given some uh, vector S and some matrix, and then you say like, okay, wait a second. When I was in school, I learned that, okay, I can solve this linear system and obtain uh, a result. So what's, what's, what's difficult uh, here? Uh, so this E has to be of weight at most so if it is if the weight is not uh, limited by some number, you can very easily uh, generate a lot of these e's. But if you must find a small weight uh, um, e, then this becomes all of a sudden uh, very difficult. So actually, both of these uh, problems, like decoding and uh, syndrome decoding, when where you have to find this e of a given small uh, weight, is actually an MP-hard problem. So it's very hard. Okay, let's go to our two um, most famous or oldest crypto systems, MacLeese and uh, Niederreiter. So I said uh, previously that we should somehow make the um, structure of the code not visible to the attacker, otherwise he will also have access to an efficient decoding. So we need to somehow hide the structure, and the idea was to sort of uh, scramble, uh, scramble uh, this matrix so in order to, to hide the structure. And uh, the legitimate user knows how to unscramble, so he has the recipe for unscrambling, and he can find uh, the secret uh, key, and the secret key is such that it, it is a, actually an efficient decoder. Whereas the, the adversary sees a random code, random codes are very hard uh, to decode. So McAleese in 78 proposed these parameters, 
So N 124 and K 524 and the number of errors uh, 50. Uh, so the number of errors uh, uh, and also these parameters ha have grown quite a bit because today this only uh, accounts for the, like 60 bits of security because of some advancement in crypto analysis, but in general, um, it was not, uh, yeah, that there isn't any uh, substantial um, uh, crypto analytic uh, result on, on mechanisms. However, neither writer was broken. And the difference is that neither writer used a different type of codes, which uh, were broken um, already in, in uh, 92. Uh, which did not happen to binary uh, uh, GOPA codes. But if you ignore which code was used, Mechilis and Niederreiter can be shown to be equivalent. So now the question is which one to use. Nowadays we use Niederreiter for some efficiency uh, uh, reasons. But here I have a comparison. So in Mechilis you get a generator matrix and two scrambling matrices S and P, and then you scramble uh, uh, G. G prime to obtain uh, the public key and you encrypt similar as in the pictures uh, uh, before to obtain your uh, result and the decryption while you go sort of back with the efficient decoder. In the Niederreiter crypto system we don't have a generator matrix but we use the parity check matrix and again we scramble and the encryption of uh, messages is following uh, this other uh, version of the problem that I told you, and this is sort of a syndrome uh, decoding problem, but they are uh, equivalent in, in terms of security. So this is the difference between the two. So if you think of attacks on the one or the other, most of the attacks apply to both. So, um, uh, okay, so today we have quite a big variety of code-based uh, crypto systems, and uh, I've listed some of uh, these here. Um, uh, like um, Mechlis and uh, Niederreiter, but also some uh, signature um, uh, schemes and quasi-cyclic schemes. We can use a variety of metrics. So typically we explain things with the humming metric because it's the easiest to, to understand and we have a, a vector and we have zeros and ones and we count the ones and that's it. There are more um, involved uh, metrics that one can use and why would someone just why would someone use more involved metrics? Well, uh, for some uh, metrics, like for example, for the rank metric, uh, it was uh, determined that, uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, parameters, they can be made more compact because the metric itself imposes that uh, somehow the problems, well, the problems are, are hard, but are, are for, for, a set of, for a level of parameters, they're harder for, for one metric than, uh, than the other. And then we can plug in a lot of codes GOPA codes, LDPCs, MDPCs, and so on. Um, uh, codes, some of, using some of these is very dangerous nowadays because we know that uh, we, can, we can sort of uh, uh, break the schemes. Okay, so what do we have today in uh, NIST, -based, uh, NIST code based camps? So this was in the third round, and um, yeah, uh, what remained is uh, three, uh, four CAM finalists and five alternates and three of those are code based and three signature finalists, no code based finalists. So there were no actually, um, yeah, there is a big uh, uh, problem. So you can think of it that it's similar with the problem in, uh, in, the, in the lattice case of constructing these hash and sign uh, signatures. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Nis then said that uh, performance wasn't a uh, primary factor, but later on it, uh, it did. Uh, become. But uh, you can see here that what remains in the in, uh, in the CAM uh, part is um, a lot of lattice-based schemes. Uh, if we ignore side that is completely broken and um, code-based schemes. And nowadays in the uh, fourth round we only have code-based schemes and things like NIST wants to standardize a code-based uh, scheme. You can ask with Dustin whether this is the case, but it, yeah, I mean, it looks like it, that's going to uh, happen. And now we have these three candidates, uh, Classic McLees, Bike, and uh, HQC. The two are uh, based on random quasi-cyclic uh, um, uh, codes or 
uh, phase cyclic uh, medium uh, density or moderate density uh, uh, codes. Uh, so I have to say that uh, previously these uh, quasi cyclic low density codes were broken, but it was cons it was discovered that you can use um, a little bit more dense, and then uh, they are not uh, broken. Um, so you can see that uh, apart from uh, MacLeese, the the others have the coding failures. So the, the decoding may fail at, the, at some point uh, as for legitimate uh, crypto systems, uh, from legitimate uh, ciphertext. Um, so this is a problem. So they have reduced the decoding failure rate. But for example, uh, for bike, there is no real proof of, the, of uh, this rate, but uh, some heuristics on, on uh, uh, heuristic bounds. Um, okay, so uh, maybe you're interested in performance. If you take a look at uh, classic MacLeese and Bike and HPC and compare it to Kyber, the public keys of MacLeese are huge, but of the others are comparable to Kyber. And the private key even uh, smaller. The ciphertext, well, yeah, the ciphertext sort of slightly, um, slightly bigger. And this is how many things you can do per second. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Bike and uh, HQC uh, have good, quite good performance, uh, but uh, yeah, you, one can always argue that we don't know enough about their security, uh, but uh, um, yeah, I can also argue that um, uh, Classic McAleese has, has been uh, sitting in the drawer for way too long, and there were other cases uh, in the NIST competition with schemes that were there for a very long time and eventually got broken. So yeah, that's nothing to, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, to, to, to be your um, uh, benchmark sort of. So security of code-based cryptography. What is very interesting that the state of the art today of decoding um, codes is this uh, 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 information set decoding that's been out there for a very long time and has been uh, improved uh, uh, over and over, so, so since the 60s. So, <clears throat> for example, if you have, if you're given a random code and you would naively want uh, to, to see how much time you would need to, uh, to decode, so this is your uh, syndrome, this is the, the matrix, and this is your error with uh, T errors. Uh, so, they're, they're put in this, uh, yeah, uh, constellation here so that you see that each, uh, if we have ones here in the error, they correspond to columns of, uh, of H. So sort of an error defines which columns you add up to uh, S. So the straightforward idea is to try out all of them that are of size N, uh, uh, size T. So all uh, uh, linear combinations of T columns and you're done. So, so this is your upper bound on the complexity um, and yeah. You would, you would need to do this and, and choose t times. Uh, this one can benefit uh, greatly uh, if you use the so-called birthday uh, paradox, where instead of, uh, <clears throat> instead of looking for a candidate in a, in a list, you look for a collision in the list. So with the birthday paradox, we have a quadratic uh, uh, speed up, and then you would have approximately this many uh, operations, which you can do even better by using the power of linear algebra, and that's in information uh, set decoding. And in information set decoding, you, <coughs> you sort of uh, choose n minus k uh, uh, columns of this, uh, of this um, uh, h that are part of this k, and then uh, hope that in the rest, all positions are error-free. So this is your information set. That, so the set that gives you the entire information that you actually need. Because there is redundancy, you would um, actually just want to find error-free positions in order to be able uh, to um, decode. And then um, <coughs> this algorithm is similar in the sense to the naive one where you first uh, sort of make an assumption of what is going to be. So you say like, oh, okay, this is my information set. So you pick your columns and say, this is my information set. And then you calculate something and you check whether this was correct. So, so in a way you, you guess and then you confirm. So you have some probability of being right 
and then some work to be done. And so the combination of the two gives you uh, the cost of the um, information set, uh, set uh, decoding. Uh, so if you have uh, guessed it, uh, if you have guessed it right, so, and if this is, this, you're going to put it into uh, an identity matrix by some uh, Gaussian um, uh, elimination. In that case, in that case, this S times U will have exactly weight T because of this uh, matrix. And you can uh, uh, calculate uh, the column operations and it's, it's much uh, smaller, but then you, <coughs> you would have to multiply by one over the uh, probability to get it uh, right. You could do slightly better by relaxing this uh, error freeness. So this was in 62, but then in 88, this, was, this, this relaxing was done. And then <coughs> even uh, afterwards, uh, it was thought, like, okay, so we can use, we can combine the two. You can use the birthday uh, paradox and we can use the information uh, set decoding. And the high level idea here is that you, again, uh, split the matrix in, uh, into these uh, parts, but then you say like, okay, so I will allow a few errors here and uh, here, no, uh, here, like at, at some point, no errors and here the rest of the errors. So previously this was error, um, error free. And this is uh, exactly as in the previous uh, slide if you don't use um, uh, uh, Gaussian elimination, but with a slight relaxation of, of the error, if you don't lose birthday paradox, but with a slight relaxation of the error. Uh, but then the idea is to use the birthday paradox on this uh, part here and gain from the birthday speed up. A lot of calculation bring you to some uh, speed up here, and today there are very advanced uh, techniques uh, for, for um, ISD uh, that uh, uh, improve on, on this uh, birthday, uh, uh, birthday part. Okay, let's go there. And we have, uh, yeah, we have advanced uh, the information set uh, uh, decoding, but, uh, well, the advancement is, is not huge. Uh, here are some, oh, okay, wait. Yeah, here's some um, uh, timeline. So, Prange in uh, uh, 62 uh, made this basic information set decoding that uh, I explained. And if you uh, put this into asymptotic terms, you get uh, this complexity with this exponent here. And there were, were some improvements with uh, the bird improvement coming here that offered uh, uh, super polynomial speed up and so on and so on. And for example, currently this is, this is our um, uh, baseline um, approach and you see there is improvement but uh, yeah you might argue that it's not huge and then a lot of improvements a lot of improvements and um yeah so now we have this exponent here so the exponent gets uh, smaller but you again see some sort of a convergence uh, here and you can expect that yeah that's that's what we we can get from um ISD attacks um, okay, so security of code-based crypto, how about other attacks? Well, there are quite a lot of other attacks, and I will start with the, the most recent one, and that's, uh, uh, in, if you use the lattice terminology, uh, dual um, attacks. And, um, and this use some sort of a statistical decoding where they reduce the problem to a uh, sort of a lattice problem or a learning uh, parity with noise. Problem and it people showed that it outperforms ISD for low rate codes where the rate is smaller. But this is very recent, and there were some papers out. Um, well, there were some errors in the papers in the estimation of the security. So now they're trying to fix the error and show how this works and so on. So I would say this is very is brand new, but it's very interesting because it goes into a different direction and tries a different approach. So we, ha we have hit the wall with ISD, so there's not much to do with ISD. So um, yeah, uh, we, have, uh, we have something, uh, something better. Uh, the code one out of many, so or the Doom um, uh, attack, which uh, it's, it's basically, uh, if, the F if the attacker is given a bunch of ciphertext, he, his goal is to decrypt or to decode uh, one of them, uh, any. 
So this may may look at as if it is important into in the multi-user setting, but because of the structure of some codes, especially quasi-cyclic codes, you can uh, transfer the the decoding problem of uh, the quasi-cyclic code to a multi-user setting and use this attack to gain a lot. So to have quite a big uh, uh, speed up, uh, as we can see here. And there are some key recovery attacks like. Um, on LDPC codes that I mentioned uh, previously. Um, and these are polynomial time attack and they, they come from the fact that the generator matrix of these LDPC codes is very sparse. And uh, if, you, if you say that I will have only a fixed number of ones in, in each column, then you can break this polynomial. But if you, if you say that, okay, then I will let the, the density of the matrix uh, grow as the dimensions grow, then this yeah uh, turns into a, a non-polynomial attack, and then you can argue that you can use these. Okay, and something that turns out to be very important nowadays it's a reaction attacks and has to do with the decoding failures. So think of two parties like a generic um, uh, usage or use case of uh, public key uh, cryptography. So. And you have some uh, bad guy that communicates to uh, a good guy, and he just uh, wants to do the following. So gets a message, creates a ciphertext, and send it to, uh, to the good guy. The good guy does something uh, in a protocol and doesn't send anything back. But everything is fine, so the protocol proceeds. Think of a, uh, whatever protocol that we use today and uh, in which uh, we have a decryption on one side and so on, and at some point, it turns out that the good guy cannot decode and says like, oh, okay, something went wrong. Can you resend this again? And then the bad guy realizes that there has been a decoding uh, failure for, for this particular uh, ciphertext. And so, it, uh, magically, without any other information being sent back, the bad guy very often can uh, figure out what the key is and break this key. This is all something like uh, magic, and uh, I, I, I have to say that at the beginning of the NIST uh, competition, there were uh, quite a few um, schemes that did have decoding failures, and quite a few of them did not understand the power of these attacks, because they would say like, okay, I have a decoding failure once in uh, uh, 2 to the 32 uh, messages. That should be a lot. I mean, even if someone uses it, then they would need quite a lot of uh, them to break the scheme, right? Well, this turned out not to be the case, and uh, some of them were broken with a very few of these decoding uh, failures. And so then the prudent practice became that these need to be, uh, these need to be much, uh, uh, much lower the decoding failure rates. So nowadays, uh, at the same level of the security level. Uh, so for example, yeah, okay, I mentioned this. So for example, in uh, Niederreiter, um, <clears throat> uh, remember that this was your, this was our parity check matrix. This was the uh, error vector that we want to find out, and this is our uh, uh, our syndrome. So, in the previous one, we can, uh, in the previous uh, picture, we can, uh, as a as an attacker, we can uh, keep um, uh, adding columns of this uh, H to the syndrome and uh, uh, trying out the attack and with uh, each column, because each column corresponds to the uh, uh, one in the error vector, we can test whether this will uh, give us a decryption failure or, uh, or not. And uh, for example, uh, we know that the decoders can decode up to some uh, uh, t, uh, errors up to some t, and if we, in this case, introduce more errors than the decoder can handle, the decoder will, will fail. Um, so we, we we get that so um, and so on and so on. Yeah, for example, if we added the blue one, we will introduce the introduce an error, and this will enlarge the number of errors in the in the error vector. If we did not add um, a, a column that corresponds to one, then nothing will happen. The decoding will uh, will go on, and we can uh, we can do this. So it turns out that this can be combined with ISD uh, attacks. And and get like uh, even with not uh, 
so big uh, communication with with uh, with a good party obtain some uh, some information. Okay. Uh, so the thing is that the previous attack actually here the the adversary uh, constructs uh, cipher texts. Uh, so it's a cipher text uh, chose, uh, chosen attack, chosen cipher text attack. Sorry, and uh, um, you will say, okay, but nowadays we do have mechanisms against it. So uh, chosen cipher text uh, attack security, right? And all the NIST competition um, candidates do have this, uh, but <clears throat> the thing is that. Uh, this, what I, sh I showed previously, uh, uh, can be done even, even in the CCA setting and even to uh, uh, crypto systems that do not have uh, decryption failure attacks but are code based, like Mechilis. Mechilis also has a decoder that can handle up to some amount of errors but not, uh, not uh, all of them. Uh, so the thing is that um, the mechanisms that we have nowadays with chosen ciphertext security will prevent this happening in two parties communicating, but it will not prevent this if we have some side channel information, so in a side channel attack. Uh, in, in that case, we can just somehow observe uh, through a side channel the information that is being, um, uh, that is being uh, um, leaked while this uh, failure occurred and then use this as information. So this is really powerful nowadays and it's being used uh, extensively. Uh, until very recently, there was no key recovery attack, even using side channels, but uh, there is uh, now, they were all message recovery uh, attacks. And um, yes, uh, there are other problems like the coding algorithms are very difficult to make constant time. And uh, we have quite a lot of timing attacks and uh, rejection sampling attacks on, on these. So um, at this point, side channel attacks are the biggest issue that we have in, in post quantum schemes, in, in my opinion. And uh, um, yes, so we, we really need to understand this better so that uh, we can um, improve the performance and then offer some uh, cheap and effective uh, countermeasures. Uh, so I will just briefly say something about the additional round on signatures. Um, as uh, I mentioned previously, and Lee also mentioned, there is a there is a problem with in the coding type of uh, schemes uh, to uh, uh, to produce um, a hash and sign signature. But in the uh, additional round and the on ramp round, we have some uh, new ideas. Well, they're not uh, new ideas, but they they are ideas that were. Uh, sort of um, that that surfaced during the, the first three rounds of uh, of NIST. That yeah, we can use some sort of um, um, uh, constructions like uh, future mirror. So five of these are future mirror signatures. Uh, the lithium is also future mirror signature. And uh, interestingly, three of them are based on uh, equivalence uh, problems. Uh, these these last two here, three here, yeah, these three here, and the First one is okay. Wait, so I will ju jump the future mirror signature part. Okay, okay, I will go just go back. So three of them are based on um, uh, equivalence problem, and they're like they're they're different in the metric. So for example, um, uh, less is in the humming metric, while well, Mets and Altec in the are in the rank uh, matrix, and they're based on what is called a, a code equivalence uh, problem. And it's very different from the syndrome decoding and the decoding uh, problem. And, uh, okay, so, sorry, here it is. So, um, to continue the, <laughs> uh, the shameless uh, uh, advertisement of uh, uh, my own work, so I've been involved in the uh, METS uh, sub submission here that is uh, in the rank metric. Uh, but this one is, all, is very, very similar. If you go to the website uh, of NIST, you will not see Altec being listed as a code-based one, but you can easily see it as a code-based one uh, based on the code equivalence uh, problem. Uh, uh, so yeah, um, we will see uh, uh, what will happen to these. These are very interesting to do uh, cryptanalysis on and to learn a lot about the problems, but they're not very uh, competitive when it comes to 
uh, sizes, like no future me signatures apart from lattice based one uh, currently. Um, okay. Here are some numbers if you if you would like to see. So you see the public key sizes and the signature sizes go into the kilobytes. Um, so uh, we cannot expect them to be very uh, competitive, but they do offer fresh uh, problems that are interesting to look at. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. A quick question for me. If Altec is not uh, categorized as a code-based scheme, how is it categorized? Then? In other. Just in other? Yes. Okay, like yeah, the, well, uh, uh, the, the, the thing is that Altec is defined through uh, trilinear forms, so uh, equivalence between trilinear forms, but uh, uh, we have uh, shown this and in a couple of uh, works, this has been established that the, these are all equivalent are all, these problems are all equivalent, polynomial time equivalent, and they are all uh, TI complete, which stands for tensor uh, isomorphism complete problems. So with slight uh, adjustment of uh, your view, you can uh, you can look uh, at each of them in the same way, so as, as codes in the language, for example. Thanks. Uh, so any other questions from the audience? If there are no other questions, then uh, given the time constraints, let me uh, uh, thank uh, Simona again. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.